Thank you. Could I ask the Chamber to come to order? Um, and we will now move on to the next item of business, which is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Movable Transactions Scotland Bill. And in dealing with the amendments members should have, the bill as amended at Stage 2, that is SP Bill 15A, the marshalled list and the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for around five minutes for the first division of the stage three. The period of voting for the first division will be 45 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons or enter the letters RTS in the chat function as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments and at Group 1, content of documents, I call Amendment Number 1 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as showing in the groupings. Minister, to move Amendment 1 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Presiding officer, at Stage 2, the committee agreed to a number of amendments lodged by Jeremy Balfour, which were intended to replicate a provision made at Section 2.4 of the Bill. That provision enables a condition which has to be specified to be specified by reference to another document. The amendments made at stage two were designed to add comparable provision in respect of requirements to identify a claim, encumbered property and a secured obligation in certain documents. I said at stage two that while I did not think that these amendments were strictly necessary because the context was different, we had no objection to making the changes if stakeholders considered that this clarification would be helpful. There were, however, some technical deficiencies with the amendments, and I indicated that they would need adjusting at stage three. These amendments therefore correct the technical deficiencies we identified. Amendments 1 and 2 address the unintended consequence created at stage 2 that meant that section 1 and 2 of the bill suggested that an assignation document must include reference to another document. This was never the intention and the amendments will ensure that it is not compulsory to refer to another document. Instead, the provision will simply permit reference to be made to another document. Amendments 17 and 26 remove the references to data which were inserted at stage two. Such reference is unnecessary due to the default definition of a document in the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010. Under that act, document means, and I quote, anything in which information is recorded in any form. As such, including reference to data is redundant. It is also confusing to mention it in some places and not others, and could lead to other references to document in the bill being construed more narrowly. Amendments 16 and 25 simply update some cross-references in these sections, which, as a result of another amendment made at stage two, are no longer correct. And in that, I move Amendment 1. Thank you, Minister. And I call Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Can I just briefly uh, say that we will be supporting all these amendments in this section and just to put on record my thanks uh, to the Minister for um, taking what I was looking to do at stage two and, and making sure that it will work in practice uh, and I'm grateful for his and his officials uh, work around this and look forward to supporting these uh, in due course. Thank you. Uh, Mr Balfour, I call on the Minister to wind up. Only to say uh, thank you to Mr Balfour for his constructive engagement through this process. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes, we are all agreed. I call Amendment number 2 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1. Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Uh, I call Amendment... I, sorry, I move to Group 2 on insolvency, and I call Amendment Number 3 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I call on the Minister to move Amendment 3 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Minister. At Stage 2, Jeremy Balfour also lodged a number of amendments which changed the definition of insolvency for the purpose of this Bill. These amendments were agreed. At the time, I set out my concerns about them. 
In short, I was concerned that some were unnecessary and that they did not necessarily appear to take a cohesive approach. Given the complexities in this area of law, I was therefore keen not to rush into any changes and instead take the time that was needed and available to consult with relevant academics and the accountant in bankruptcy, safe in the knowledge that we would be able to adjust this at a later stage if it was agreed that any changes were appropriate. Having taken the opportunity to consult further following stage two, that view has only been reinforced. I can give members a, a flavour of the views expressed about the amended definition of insolvency. The Accountant and Bankruptcy's Office advised that while the Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Scotland Act 2014 repealed discharge on composition in bankruptcy, it did not abolish composition more generally. One of the academics consulted noted that, consumption, noted that composition rather, at common law is still possible. Concerns were also expressed that the amendments made at stage two did not take account of international private law. A contract can provide that Scots law is to apply even where a party is not Scottish. The provisions as originally drafted covered situations which took account of cross-border issues by using non-technical language with ordinary meaning. Removing the terminology of composition was therefore considered to leave an undesirable gap. In relation to the stage two amendments which limited company voluntary arrangements to those that included the claim or property, we received advice from other insolvency academics that CVAs do not necessarily operate in this way. They are principally focused on debt and do not have to specifically involve the debtor's property. However, it was also clear from our initial consultation and the limited time available that the issues, especially in respect of protected trust deeds, are not simply ones of technicalities or semantics. They raise substantive policy issues too. That is why we intend using the time available to us over the course of the next year and the powers in the bill, which are rare for this very reason, to consult properly on the issues and bring forward informed amendments where necessary. Amendments 3 and 19 therefore reverse the amendments made at stage 2 in relation to the definition of insolvency for individuals. And amendments 4 and 21 remove the provision that a company voluntary arrangement, CVA, only constitutes the insolvency of an assigner or provider for the purposes of these provisions in the bill if it includes the claim or the encumbered property in question. One moment, please. If further consultation suggests that any further finessing of these provisions is required, then we will, of course, be open to that. But these amendments respond now to the advice received from the accountant in bankruptcy and a number of specialist insolvency academics. I'm happy to give way to Mr. Chairman Balfour. Balfour. Uh, I'm grateful for the Minister for his intervention. Would he um, agree that there have been concerns raised both by the Law Society of Scotland and also by some practitioners around this? So I welcome the further review. But will the Scottish Government commit to consult not only with academics, but with those who are practising this day in, day out? Minister. Yes, I'm happy to give that undertaking. I'll touch on some of this uh, further on in my remarks. But I do recognise there's a uh, complexity there and, and a range of views, which is why it's important we take this opportunity over the next year to consult further and with the regulation making provisions within the Act, we can act upon um, the outcome of that consultation and engagement if necessary. In relation to the Stage 2 amendments, presiding officer, which added to the definition of insolvency the making of an order sanctioning a restructuring plan under Part 26 of the Companies Act 2006, the consensus is that they may be worth retaining, at least in the meantime and possibly permanently. Part 26 of the Companies Act 2006 enables companies to apply to the court for an order sanctioning an arrangement or reconstruction agreed with a majority of members or creditors should they find themselves in financial difficulty. This issue has been discussed previously and the view, was, and the view taken was that provisions under Part 26A mainly refer to companies in difficulty as opposed to those that are actually insolvent. We were minded towards the view that this amendment could therefore be too broad. Having consulted further, we agree that relevant financial difficulties may, in practice, in fact, mean the company is technically insolvent and that the position is comparable to certain arrangements already listed in sections 4 and 47, which also do not require actual insolvency. 
While we are therefore content to retain this amendment, it was erroneously inserted into the definition of when an individual is insolvent, when it is about a company restructuring plan. Amendments 20 and 23 therefore correct the stage two amendment so that it applies to company insolvency provisions. In the course of consulting with the academic experts, a couple of other issues were identified. The first issue identified was that the matter dealt with by amendments 4 and 21 in relation to company voluntary arrangements also applies to part 26A arrangements. Amendments 6 and 23 therefore address this. The second issue identified was that from a private international law perspective, it made sense to replicate the provisions at section 46A6 and 47.3A6. Those sections include analogous arrangements worldwide in the list of circumstances for which an individual is deemed insolvent. Amendments 7 and 24 therefore now make comparable provision for corporate persons. Amendments 5 and 22 simply fix where conjunctions appear as a result of the stage 2 changes. I hope members will appreciate that the amendments I am bringing forward in this group have been based on consultation with experts in the time available. But this is not the end of the story and to reiterate my remarks to Mr Balfour, we do intend to explore this matter further to ensure the right result is reached. So I would therefore ask members to support these amendments and I move Amendment 3. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendments 4, 5, 6 and 7, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 4 to 7 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 4 to 7? No member objects. Uh, and therefore, the question is that Amendments 4 to 7 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I turn to Group 3, Review of Act. I call Amendment 8 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 34. I call on the Minister to move Amendment 8 and to speak to both amendments in the group. Minister. At stage two, four non-government amendments were lodged, which would have placed a duty on Scottish ministers to review and report on the impact of this legislation. Two of these amendments were agreed. The first of these requires us to prepare and publish a report setting out the impact of the waiver of defence clause in section 13.1. The second of these requires us to undertake a review of the Act as a whole, particularly with reference to the impact on sole traders and small businesses, and report on that review after the end of the review period. I was not in favour of either of these amendments at stage two. They seem to me to be very inflexible. On the review of defence of waiver clauses in particular, I thought that a formal review after a prescribed period of time seemed unnecessary given the lack of any indication of, of current or indeed future problems. It is dictating now the use of future resources when there may never be any issues with this provision and attention may be better used elsewhere. Both the Government and the Parliament do, of course, have the ability to carry out a review at any time, but it becomes apparent that one is appropriate. That facility, combined with a commitment to engaging with stakeholders on a regular basis on any issues with how the legislation operates in practice, seem to me a more proportionate and responsive approach. I recognise, though, that at least the general review amendment reflected a recommendation at the Stage 1 report. Rather than seek to reverse these amendments, I have instead brought forward amendments to make them work more reasonably. These amendments therefore combine the review duties. If there is a requirement to review the Act as a whole, that can of course include a review of the way that the waiver of defence clause provisions are operating. So we do not think that there is any need for a separate review. Combining the duties into one review which is carried out at the same time will also be more economical for the public purse. Amendment 34 does, however, ensure that this issue is one which the review will cover. Most importantly, unlike section 113A at present, the revised review period will be pegged to the point in time at which the main provisions of the bill come into force, as opposed to when the bill receives royal assent. 
We already know that the bill will not come into force until well into 2024. This is because the registers need to be available, the various regulations need to be in place, and the Section 104 order to bring financial instruments within the scope of the provisions needs to be agreed. If we stick with the royal assent formula for the clock to start ticking, there will be more than a year of time within the review window in which the legislation will not even have come into force. That simply, presiding officer, doesn't make sense. Amendment 34 will also extend the review period from three years to five years. The original recommendation of the committee was ambivalent on this point, recommending three to five years. We think the latter is more sensible. We only need to consider the last three years to realise that the disruption to business caused by the pandemic would likely have rendered any review premature because many relevant business activities would have been quite different from normal for a substantial period of the review period. The change to five years builds in some flexibility to what is otherwise a prescriptive approach and should hopefully ensure that there is sufficient time for the legislation to bed in properly before the review takes place. And on that, I move Amendment 8. Thank you, Minister. And I call Carol Mohan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I thank the Minister for the engagement. As he knows, I moved some of these amendments at stage two. Um, amendment 8, as you have outlined, removes the requirement of the government to report on the waiver of defence. The Minister knows I argued strongly at stage 2 that I thought it was appropriate because there was some suggestion that this may cause difficulties and we don't know. Um, and so, so a sound reporting mechanism in place to ensure the impact of the waiver of defence clause is given consideration I felt was important. Indeed, that steps are in place to ensure MSPs can question government over the impact of this clause um, should there be any um, a negative impacts identified and that require mitigation. Um, he indicated that there are options for review and I note his comments in terms of the overall review. Um, but in my view, um, having reporting expectations on this set out within the legislation removes the, removes the challenges we may face further down the line as uh, MSPs. Uh, in relation to Amendment 34, again, as you've outlined, a reporting amendment altered. Um, amendment 34 removes the requirement for the Scottish Government to report on the effectiveness of the legislation impact, impact on sole traders and individuals within three years of royal assent. This requirement is replaced, as you've said, with a duty of report within five years from the point where Section 1 and 40, 40 of the legislation come into effect. I think this is disappointing, as we do believe, and we did argue, that the three-year reporting offered a good balance for embedding the legis legislation, but good protection on any difficulties with the introduction of the legislation. So, for those reasons, we will vote against these amendments. Thank you, Ms Mochan. And I call Jeremy Balfour. Th thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, we will be uh, supporting the Scottish Government in regard to this. Um, and the reason for that is because you have brought in Amendment 34, which I think is a backstop and, and a safety that we require. I mean, I think it is fair to say, if we look back over the last 20 plus years of the Scottish Parliament, one of the things collectively we have not been good at is uh, post scrutiny legislation. Um, and often legislation which we think will work well, in practice, doesn't. And I, I, the reason that I think Amendment 34 is important is we can, in theory, think MSPs, committees will look at this and, and review it and take evidence. But in practice, that sadly doesn't often happen. So I think we do need a more formal basis for that. Uh, and I am persuaded um, by the Minister's argument in regard to extending that to a five-year period because of uh, how it will work in practice. And I think with the other amendments that are, are in place as well in regard to protection for individuals, um, I am uh, more relaxed than I was um, at stage one of this. So with uh, the guarantees that the Minister has given, um, we will on this side be supporting the two amendments. Thank you. And I call Daniel Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd very much like to, first of all, agree with my colleague, uh, Carol Mockin, but also, I think, reflect on, on a very important point that Jeremy Balfour just raised, which is actually one of the key functions of this Parliament is to review legislation. It's one of the, the, the arguments for bringing the Scottish Parliament into being, because, frankly, there was simply a lack of time to do that job in Westminster. So I therefore feel it's always disappointing when we hear from ministers that we, we don't have time or it's unnecessary 
to put these review clauses in legislation. So I welcome the fact that the Minister is maintaining it, but I would just simply ask whether or not there is need to think about uh, how the, the government does this more systematically, because I think it's something that should be incorporated as a matter of course in legislation. But critically, I'd also just like to push him on the point. Why is it an issue to name check specific issues which have occurred through the scrutiny or been highlighted through the scrutiny of legislation? Because ultimately, what is specified in legislation, both here but or more generally when this occurs, isn't prescriptive about how much work needs to go into that review, nor the length of, uh, uh, of uh, reporting that would be required, simply that the review on those topics occurs. So I'd just like to push the government because I don't think it's prescriptive. I think all it would require is for the report to contain those topics. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I call on the Minister to wind up. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I thank members for their comments and thank uh, Mr Balfour for his support. I have listened to Carol Walken and I listened to Daniel Johnson. Uh, just to refer to what the amendment actually says, what it is inserting, the Scottish ministers must, as soon as reasonably practicable after the end of the review period, undertake a review of the operations of this Act and prepare a report on that review. Two, the report must in particular set out a, an assessment of one, the impact of allowing the debtor to waive the right to assert defences as provided for in section 13.1. Two, how well the provisions regarding statutory pledges are working in relation to sole traders and small businesses. And b, the steps, if any of its Scottish ministers propose to take as a result of the findings of this review. The amendment does exactly what the Labour Party is seeking. It, it, base, it takes the two reviewing requirements that were inserted at stage two, it combines them into one so it can be more efficiently undertaken, and it extends the review period to five years. As things currently stand, the clock starts with royal assent. That would be, assuming Parliament passes the bill this afternoon, some point in the summer. So we're already one year into the review period of a three-year review period when the legislation is not in operation. So the amendments that stand from stage two are technically deficient. This is a far better solution. So I would ask the Labour Party to reconsider their opposition. This delivers exactly what the Labour Party wants. It prescribes specifically in legislation the requirements around waiver of defence and indeed the impact upon sole traders, which was the intention of Ms Mockin's amendment at stage two. And it allows the review period to operate in a way where we do not have a year where the legislation is not enforced, but that has been counted as part of the review period. So on that basis, I would ask the Labour Party to support this amendment, which is proportionate. It delivers what was agreed at stage two, but does support in a much more effective and economic Way. And that will conclude, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Uh, as this is the first division uh, of the stage three, I suspend for around five minutes to allow members to access the digital voting system.
Okay, we will now proceed with the division on Amendment 8, and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, point of order Eleanor Whittle. Thank you. Um, my app is saying vote failed, could not connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Ms Whittle. I'll make sure that vote is recorded. And the result of the vote on amendment number eight uh, in the name of Tom Arthur is yes, 89, no, 21. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore uh, agreed. The question is, we now move to group four, minor and technical amendments. I call amendment... If that was a point of order from Jackie Bailey, she's too late, I'm afraid. Um, grouping, uh, group four, minor and technical amendments. I call amendment nine in the name of the minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I invite the minister to move the amendment and speak to all other amendments in the group. Minister. Amendments nine and ten are of a minor and technical nature and correct an oversight. At stage two, amendments were agreed to section 14 of the bill regarding the right to withhold performance until certain information about an assignation is provided. Those amendments made provision as to how the rules in that section applied to co-debtors. The amendments should also have been applied to the case where the request relates to any condition attached to the assignation. That is achieved by these amendments. This means that there will be consistency across Section 14 that a co-debtor can only withhold performance where awaiting a response to a request they have made. Turning next to Amendments 15 and 32, two amendments were agreed at Stage 2 which had the effect of adding trustees and agents to the definitions of secured creditor and assignee. At the time, I set out my concerns about these amendments being both unnecessary and confusing. The general law of agency already applies without agents needing to be expressly mentioned. But in any event, there is also provision made about representatives at section 116.2 of the bill, which explicitly provides that someone who is required to do a thing can have someone else do it for them. I have considered whether we can reasonably maintain the provisions as amended at stage two, if they could be said to be unnecessary but harmless. However, we feel that, while well-intentioned, they are, in fact, actively problematic. Legislation does not normally deal expressly with trustees and agents, since the general law deals with this suitably, and it would be cumbersome to always have to mention every possible representative capacity in which a person could act. Mentioning trustees and agents here in the way that has been done could have unhelpful consequences for other legislation. More directly, these stage two amendments mention agents in relation to assignees, but not assignors, suggesting that an assignor could not appoint an agent, which is not the intention. The same issue arises in relation to providers, where the change that has been made implies that they could not appoint an agent. 
Further problems could also arise, such as that an agent may be authorised to undertake one task but not another, and yet the amendment includes them wholesale. Ris risks empowering an agent to act beyond the authority, authority that the person appointing them has authorised. Amendments 15 and 32 therefore reverse the amendments made at stage 2 by removing the references to trustees or agent from the respective definitions of secured creditor and assignee. However, I would emphasise that this does not mean that trustees or agents will be unable to act. The former Scottish Law Commissioner responsible for the Bill has confirmed that he agrees with our approach on this. Turning now to Amendment 27, Section 76 sets out the circumstances in which a secured creditor must make an application for the removal of an entry from the statutory pledges record. One of the circumstances is where diligence has been executed against the encumbered property of the statutory pledge. In the course of consulting further with the Scottish Law Commission's working group, as promised in respect of a non-government amendment lodged to this section at stage two, it was flagged that execution of diligence is the starting point and not the same as the realisation of the property as a result of the diligence. Amendment 27 therefore replaces the reference to execution with enforcement in section 76 on the basis that it is arguably premature to tie the commencement of diligence to the making of an application for the mandatory removal of an entry from the statutory pledges record. As often diligence is executed, but realisation of the property never happens for one reason or another. Finally, we have identified a discrepancy between part one and part two of the bill. In part one, it is stated that where two or more persons are co-assigners or co-assignees in relation to a claim, a reference to an assignor or assignee is to be read as meaning all of them. The equivalent interpretation section for part two of the bill did not include comparable provisions. Amendment 33 rectifies the position so the same rule is applied to co-providers and co-secured creditors of a statutory pledge. And in that, I move Amendment 9. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. No other members have asked to speak. I, I would invite the Minister if he has any further comments to make in winding up, Minister. Nothing further to add. In which case, the question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 9. Uh, Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. We move to Group 5, Fees. I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister. Group with Amendment 29. The Minister to move Amendment 11 and speak to the other amendment in the Group. Minister. In the Committee's Stage 1 report, they recommended that not-for-profit money advisors be exempted from the fee structure, which will apply to searches of the assignation record and the statutory pledges record in cases where those advisors do not charge individuals for their services. Amendments intended to achieve this were agreed at stage two. I did not support the amendments on the basis that the fees which will apply for registration events and searches in the two new registers will be the subject of consultation before the fee structure is established in regulations under the bill. That consultation remains, in my view, the best vehicle for a proper examination of all of the issues. On a practical level, at stage two, individuals acting as consumers were removed from being able to grant a statutory pledge under part two of the bill. If this change is made, it is unclear to me why not-for-profit money advisors would be routinely searching the register of statutory pledges on behalf of individual consumers. There is also some doubt over whether, the, whether searches of the register of assignations would be of much assistance to not-for-profit money advisors. Where debts have been assigned in a bulk assignation transaction, it is highly unlikely that the debtor's name will appear anywhere on the register. And, in any event, the register can only be searched by reference to the assignor of the debt, not the debtor. In addition, the system has been designed so that the debtor is not expected to search the register. That is why the bill provides that a simple failure to search the register does not mean that the debtor is acting in bad faith if they make payment to the original creditor. Having said all of that, I appreciate the spirit behind the intention of the amendments made at stage two, and I also accept that as likely usage will be de minimis, there is no real harm in these amendments. 
Registers of Scotland have raised some valid logistical issues about how eligibility for an examination would work in practice, but these should be capable of being addressed out with the Bill. I am therefore not seeking to overturn these amendments, but I do want to address a potential unintended consequence. As the Bill stands, the exemptions can be read as applying to searches made by not-for-profit money advisors who do not charge individuals for services regardless of whether the search in question is actually being carried out for an individual or for a corporate body. These amendments would therefore clarify that the exemption would apply only where the search in question is being carried out by a not-for-profit money advisor on behalf of an individual who is receiving their services pro bono. I therefore remove Amendment 11. Thank you, Minister. You've left colleagues speechless once again. I don't know whether there's anything you want to add in your wind-up. Nothing further. No. The question is, therefore, that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. We move to Group 6, Extracts. I call Amendment 12 in the name of the Minister, Group with Amendments 13, 30 and 31. I invite the Minister to uh, move Amendment 12 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Minister. The Land Registration Scotland Act 2012 makes provision which enables a request for an extract from a land register to be limited to a specified point in time. In turn, the keeper has a duty to meet such a request, but only where it is reasonably practicable to do so. At the suggestion of the Registers of Scotland, Amendments 12 and 30 make equivalent provision in respect of the two registers provided for in the Bill. This is a sensible and proportionate measure. Amendments 13 and 31 are consequential amendments to take account of the fact that an extract will therefore therefore no longer always be evidence of the contents of the register at the time it is issued. It might instead be evidence of the contents at a specified point in time. Then that, I will move Amendment 12. Thank you again. No other members wish to uh, speak. Is there anything you wish to add by way of wind-up, Minister? Nothing further, Presiding Officer. No. Then question then is Amendment 12 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. We are agreed. I call Amendment 13 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 12. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. That, uh, I, Parliament's asked to the question that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. We move to Group 7, Assignation uh, Information Rights. I call Amendment 14 in the name of the Minister, in a group of its own. Minister to move and speak to Amendment 14. Minister. Section 34 of the Bill requires a registered assignee to provide information about certain matters to specified people with irrelevant interest. A concern was raised by a member of the Scottish Law Commission Working Group that the Bill does not hold the registered assignee liable for failure to provide relevant information that is not expressly covered by the duty in Section 34. We have therefore looked again at what information we require the registered assignee to provide. We do not think it would be reasonable to hold the registered assignee liable unless there is a clear requirement to provide information on a particular matter, and it is information that is within their knowledge. The example which was raised as a particular concern was whether the claim has been further assigned by the registered assignee. Amendment 14 therefore adds a further subsection to section 34.1 so that a registered assignee is required to answer a query as to whether a further assignation document has been granted by them. As, inform as this information will always be within their knowledge and as it is relevant to the question of whether that person continues to hold the claim, we consider it reasonable that this information should be provided in the limited circumstances covered by section 34. Then that, I move Amendment 14. Thank you, Minister. Again, no members, other members wish to speak. Minister, anything you wish to add by way of wind-up? Nothing further. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call Amendments 15, 16 and 17, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 15 to 17 on block. Moved on block. Uh, I would ask any member uh, to object to the single question being put. No, there are no objections. Therefore, uh, the question is that amendments 15 to 17 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. Group 8 on the uh, pledge sole traders, etc. Call amendment uh, uh, 18 in the name of the Minister and the group on its own. I, I invite the Minister to move and speak to amendment 18, Minister. When the principles of this bill were debated in this chamber at stage one, I gave an undertaking to remove the ability of individual consumers to grant a statutory pledge. 
This was in response to the concerns which had been expressed by Citizens Advice Scotland and the money and debt advice agencies about the possibility that predatory lenders would abuse the new statutory pledge by offering loans to vulnerable consumers using ordinary household goods as collateral. Those concerns were also echoed by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in their Stage 1 report. However, there was also consensus that in changing this for individuals, sole traders should not be stripped of the ability to benefit from using the statutory pledge. The promised amendments to exclude individual consumers were passed at Stage 2. As such, an individual can now only grant a statutory pledge if acting in the course of their business or the activities of a charity or unincorporated association. In such a case, the assets also have to be permitted assets. The most crucial part of that rule is that it means that for sole traders, the asset has to be a business asset, one used wholly or mainly for the purposes of their business. However, to ensure we fully protect ordinary household assets from being pledged, we also impose a minimum monetary value. This provides an added protection for sole traders in respect of assets which are used for a dual purpose, for example, primarily for business purposes, but occasionally for personal purposes. We set that threshold at £3,000, which was significantly higher than the comparable threshold of £1,000, which the Bill, as introduced, included for individual consumers. Importantly, there is also a power to amend the threshold at any time. However, an amendment was also passed at Stage 2, which provided that the monetary limit for the value of property to be pledged should be subject to annual update in line with the Retail Prices Index. I said at the time that, while well-intentioned, we think it is unnecessary to make provision in this way. Notwithstanding the recent cost crisis, inflation in the past few years has been relatively low, and the current figure is expected to fall. The threshold which was introduced at Stage 2 is significantly higher than the comparable £1,000 threshold which applied to individual consumers at introduction. This new threshold is set at £3,000, and there is a power allowing the threshold to be increased further, as and when that is appropriate. And crucially, this threshold is not the primary means of protecting ordinary household items from being pledged. That is achieved by excluding individual consumers altogether, and by only allowing sole traders to pledge business assets. The situation is therefore now very different from the one in which the committee commented in its Stage 1 report. To amend a figure in the Act annually would mean that affirmative regulations have to be brought before the Parliament. Since the rise will often be of a negligible order, we did not believe that this was the best use of parliamentary time. Any approach that ties the figure exactly to an inflationary calculation would also lead to unmemorable figures like £3,277.63, rather than the clarity and simplicity of having a threshold at like £3,000 or £3,500 and so on. Those were the reasons for why I did not think it was necessary or appropriate for there to be a requirement for annual operating of the threshold, as opposed to simply an ability to adjust the figure. However, I have other concerns about the specific amendment which was made at Stage 2. Importantly, it did not actually provide for the threshold to be changed on the face of the Act. We believe this would lead to significant confusion. This confusion could not even be avoided by ministers using the separate powers that exist to change the figure on the face of the Act. The way the provision works, any new figure inserted under that power would itself have to be read as if further increased by inflation. There would therefore be double counting, as well as people still being told by the Act that the threshold is a figure which is not actually the threshold. I do not think that that is an acceptable outcome. I appreciate the good intentions behind the provision. Even though the threshold is not the primary means of keeping out ordinary household goods, it is absolutely right that it keeps pace with inflation over time. But we already have a mechanism to ensure that this happens. I remain strongly of the view that it would be more efficient to simply update the figure as and when required, taking into account the level of inflation prevalent at the time. 
Depending on that rate of inflation, the figure in the Act may have to be amended more often if inflation is higher, but less often if it is lower. This is altogether a more flexible and responsive approach. It also avoids all of the significant technical difficulties with the detail of amendment which was made at stage two. In short, should the threshold rise over time? Yes. But we are best to do so using the existing power on the bill, not an annual formula-driven approach, especially one which people are left to work out for themselves. So we have a common aim, but simply a different means of achieving that aim. For all of those reasons, this amendment reverses the changes made at stage two and removes the provision that the threshold should be read as subject to annual update in line with the retail price index. And I would ask members to support it. And on that, I move Amendment 18. Thank you, Minister. I now call Carol Mochin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by uh, acknowledging the protections around household goods that were brought into place at stage two? And I do acknowledge the Minister's discussions that we had around that and thank him for, for doing that. Um, as he said, the amendment removes my amendment, uh, uh, amendment 18 removes my amendment at stage two about the annual uprating. And I have listened quite closely to what the minister has said, as he has acknowledged himself as quite a technical piece of legislation. This, and so, in some ways, the, a lot of what the minister has done so far today has. Um, been tidying up amendments and so some of his remarks I'm wondering if we could have tidied up some of this because I do believe that the committee report did make recommendations about the retail price index reference um, and at stage two we did agree you know that, that there was quite broad agreement that that would be helpful and certainly at stage one it was across the parties and that the automatic updating annually um, in terms of reference to the retail price index ensures that there is, it is explicitly within the bill. Uh, there would be an expectation about the ability to increase that figure, um, but there would be the delegated powers to, to perhaps round the figures up if that was the, if that was the point that, that, that you were making in your remarks. Um, and that the Scottish Government, um, you know, we, we need to ensure that the Scottish Government have, have a reason and, 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 a, and, a, and a, a date that they do have to look at this and that I think was the purpose of linking it to the retail price index. I do appreciate that the Minister does see this as an overkill but I do believe it would be helpful to have in the, 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 the bill that the, the Parliament has to regularly update it and it would seem sensible that they would link it to the retail price index. So um, I think overall that I would say that that amendment was justified and that there would have been tidying up that we could have done to make that work. Um, but I do thank the Minister for his remarks in uh, this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Mochan. I now call Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy Officer. I, I think it would be fair to say of all the areas within the bill, this was probably the most controversial that we looked at when we took evidence and in our stage one report. Um, and I did support uh, the amendments which are now seeking to be overturned um, at stage two, because I and I think everyone on the committee felt there had to be a mechanism there to see that figure increase as, as time went on. Um, having listened uh, to the minister um, this afternoon, um, I am persuaded again with his uh, debating skills to support this amendment and um, we, we on this bench will. I am sure that as time goes on and if for whatever reason Scottish ministers didn't increase this figure, there would come pressure from outside groups, from third parties and from opposition um, groups to see that figure go up. And so I think this does give us a way forward to be reassured that the amount of money will go up but at the same time, I, I do take the point that uh, it won't be on the face of the bill with any changes, and it will mean that there won't be an absolute clarity in regard to what um, people will look at that bill and understand it to be. And also, we could end up with some really strange figures, depending on what figure inflation is. So uh, with all those um, considerations taken in, um, we will be supporting uh, the Government's amendment in regard to this. Mr. Balfour, and I call Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It was my proposal at the Delegated Personal Reform Committee that an automatic inflator was inclu included in the bill. And it's disappointing that the Minister perhaps couldn't have been more innovative in his response simply to extract this measure 
which, as he admitted, was well-intentioned. And I think, uh, you know, I'm glad that he at least recognises that. But surely he recognises that other practices across government, for example, most benefits in the Social Security system are uprated every April according to the Consumer Prices Index. And that was the spirit in which this was being attempted to achieve. So if he doesn't think this particular amendment was well drafted, perhaps he could at least give a commitment that the government will undertake to review the threshold every financial year by statutory instrument and operate it accordingly. OK, maybe an automatic formula will produce odd figures, but even then that could have been adjusted to say, uh, round it to the nearest £100 and so on, so it simplifies the procedure. And perhaps there could be an alternative mechanism to achieve the outcome we agree is ne needed to safeguard it, create a double lock, if you like, um, would be to commit through statutory instrument every financial year to review the figure um, so that it can be inflation-proofed accordingly. And similar practice to is undertaken for Social Security benefits. Thank you, Mr Sweeney. And I call Daniel Johnson. Uh, th thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. I mean, just really to re reiterate the points that have been made by my colleagues, Karen Walken and, and, and Paul Sweeney, and just really to point out, Minister, even 2%, which is the target rate targeted by the Bank of England, over five years would, would in effect mean that any figure is worth 10% less over that five years because of compounding. So while I accept that, that, that what is going to be in this bill gives the ministers the ability uh, to do it, that means they can do it, it doesn't mean that they, they will or have to. And, and I think in as much as the, the minister understandably objects to some other elements being a, a, about you know, time consuming and about not, not overcomplicating things, surely this having a mechanism to deal with this, that it happens automatically, makes life simpler for the government. So, very much in the spirit of, of what Paul Sweeney was just saying there, while I understand there may be technical problems with what was there, surely it would have been better to have tidied that up and ensure there was a, a, a mechanism to make it simpler, straightforward, and ensure that it does happen, not just ensure that it can happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I call Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Just on this particular amendment, I think the, I think the key point for me in this, uh, in this particular one is the, the starting point. Uh, when the committee examined uh, and kind of got the figures to uh, kind of extrapolate where inflation would be uh, and kind of what the, the initial sum would have been, it, it actually went from 1,000 to about 1,300 pounds. So I think it's fair to say that the, everyone in the committee was quite surprised by such a, a low threshold. So the starting point, in, which we've already agreed uh, thus far, is to be a 3,000 pounds. So with that, uh, for me, I think that's actually extremely important in terms of safeguarding of all of our constituents and safeguarding consumers. And so with that, I'm quite content, uh, quite content now, uh, just three seconds, I'm quite content now that uh, to have that starting point, but also with, uh, with what the, the Minister said already in the record, uh, that, uh, that this can be amended uh, on, a, on an annual basis, uh, then I think that actually would be uh, very much useful. Well, I'll take the amendment, the, the oh, intervention. I think the, the, the committee conveners uh, for taking that intervention. And I think he makes an important point. The threshold has been increased substantially. We should welcome the measures the government has responded to. I'm not trying to make an intervention in, in this in bad faith in any measure. I just think that we all want to try and achieve the same aim, which is efficient legislation. Um, this was a measure to ensure that the depreciation, if you like, of the real value of this um, threshold wasn't eroded over time. We know that there's many instances where government is just busy and it sometimes neglects to keep things up to date. Um, and this was just a way of making sure that that was automatically adjusted. Uh, and before we know it, we're not in a situation, you know, um, 10 years down the line where it's been forgotten about and then people are having uh, possessions taken uh, as a result of a, a sort of neglect uh, to keep the legislation up to date. So even if there was a mechanism by which the government was compelled every financial year to uprate it through statutory instrument, at least that would be a satisfy, satisfactory remedy if the proposed amendment to stage two isn't, isn't um, effective. Stuart McMillan. Thank you. No, I, I, I generally accept the point that Paul Sweeney uh, is making. I mean, did have a, uh, a fairly large uh, debate about this in committee, but uh, I'm quite sure certain of the comments that the Minister has already put in the record today. Uh, and uh, I would like to think that uh, the members of the Delegated Powers and Reform Committee, uh, all uh, five of us uh, in the committee uh, so far, uh, that, uh, that we will ensure that uh, we will be keeping this uh, very much uh, to the fore uh, in, the, uh, in the years to come, particularly in this session, whilst, uh, whilst we're all still here. And Minister to wind up. President Officer, can I, I thank all members for their comments and contributions and also for their constructive engagement through this process. I, I welcome the uh, support of uh, Mr Balfour and his party. I can also recognise the amendments from Ms Mock and, and indeed 
the inception of the idea um, from Mr Sweeney as being well-intentioned. I do recognise that we do have within our um, various statutory frameworks automatic operating mechanisms, but equally there are areas where we are only are able to um, operate through um, SSIs, within the case of UK legislation, SIs. And there's a number of places where this can occur in regards to council tax reductions or earning arrestment thresholds. Um, for example, under diligence legislation. I think what's important to recognise and what makes this slightly separate from some of the and not quite as directly comparable is that the £3,000 threshold is part of a suite of measures to protect individuals. The first and most significant, of course, was the removal of individuals acting in their capacity as a consumer from the scope of the legislation with regards to statutory pledges. That was, I think, Mr Balfour made reference to perhaps what would have been the most contentious. I think that was overall the most contentious issue when the bill was introduced. Um, the second element are the protections that exist there for those individuals acting in their capacities as sole traders or as businesses, um, namely that goods can only be pledged which are wholly or mainly for the purpose of business use. So that in itself would exclude household goods um, in the main. And notwithstanding that, we have increased the threshold to £3,000, which is significant. And of course, we do retain powers through the legislation uh, subject to the Government of Parliament, which will allow for operating to take place. And I would recognise the point over a, a period of time that um, the, the, the member suggested that um, there is a risk that the legislation is um, neglected and operating does not take a place. Well, Parliament has agreed amendments to ensure that a, a review of the legislation will take place within five years of it coming into effect. And notwithstanding that, there is nothing that precludes Parliament from conducting its own post-legislative reviews into the legislation. So I, I am satisfied that the measures we have in place will safeguard individuals acting in their capacity as sole traders, as businesses. Um, I am satisfied that we have been able to reach a balanced uh, approach through the changes that we have made to the legislation, which remove individuals acting in their capacity as consumers, but allow for sole traders to um, benefit from the provisions that are in statutory pledges with additional pr uh, protections, recognising the concerns that were raised. But of course, this is a matter that we will keep under review, and we do have that power to respond, um, should it be required, in the near, medium or long term, to operate the £3,000 threshold. And on that, I would um, ask members to support the amendment. Thank you very much, Minister. The question is Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a vote, and members should cast their votes now. And that's the vote closed. Point of order, Carol Mochin. Um, my uh, uh, phone didn't seem to connect. I do apologise. I would have voted no. <laughs> Thank you, Ms Mochin. I can confirm your vote was already um, cast. Thank you. Point of order, Denny Minto. My phone didn't connect either. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Ms Minto. I'll make sure that is recorded.
And the result of the vote on amendment number 18 in the name of Tom Arthur is yes, 90, no, 22. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Call amendments 19, 20, 21, 22 and 23, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move uh, the amendments 19 to 23 on block. Moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put uh, on amendments 19 to 23? And no objections. The question is that amendments 19 to 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. We move to group uh, 9, pledge, amendment of pledge. I call amendment uh, 24 in the name of the Minister. Group with amendment 28. Minister to move amendment 24 and speak to both amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Starting with Amendment 20, this arises out of the concern expressed by Registers of Scotland that there was an inconsistency between Section 56.5, which deals with when amendments to a statutory pledge take effect, and Section 86, which deals with when an amendment to a statutory pledge can be registered. Section 56 is a standalone rule about when the change to increase a statutory pledge takes effect in certain circumstances. It does not introduce any overriding stipulation about what can be registered. The intention behind Section 86 is to restrict registration of amendment documents to those cases where an amendment document requires to be registered in order to take effect. Where the secured obligation is being increased, registration is only required if the current extent of the obligation is clear from the face of the register and people would therefore be misled if that was left unchanged. However, it is clear that the lack of symmetry between the two sections is potentially confusing. Amendment 28 is intended to make the interpretation of Section 86 clearer by instead cross-referencing to Section 56. Importantly, it does not change the result in policy terms. In looking at all of this, we came to the view that Section 56.5 was not as clear as it could be about when things take effect where the, amendment, where the amended document does more than one thing. To take one example, an amendment document removes property A from the pledge and replaces it with property B. The removal of property A would not ordinarily need to be registered to take effect, but the addition of property B would. We think the Bill should be clear about whether the rule about the amendment only applying on registration covers the removal of property A too, or whether it just covers adding property B. We would not want to leave a gap, meaning that the creditor had no security over anything for a short period. We understand that this will happen rarely as they are established drafting techniques to capture the addition of future property, but Amendment 24 closes any potential gap. It provides that the default position should be that the two things take place at the same time, but allows the parties to contract out of that if they so wish. The ability to contract out will, of course, be confined to the extra element of the amendment, which, if it was being done in a separate document, would not require registration to take effect. It will therefore always be the case that adding property or increasing the secured obligation where the extent of it is clear from the register will require effective registration. And in that, I move Amendment 24. Thank you very much, Minister. No other members are seeking to speak. Minister, is there anything you wish to add by way of wind-up? Nothing further. Thank you. The question is Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament has agreed. I call Amendments 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33 and 34. Uh, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments uh, 25 to 34 uh, on block. Minister. Moved on block. Does any member uh, object to a single question being put? There is, an ob there is an objection in relation to which amendment in particular? Point of order. Oh. Very grateful for the clarification that 34 was excluded from that block, wasn't it? It, it wasn't, but if that is your preference, um, and you, you have no objection to, to the amendment others being taken 34 on from the block question. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. So does any member have any objection uh, to a single question being put on amendments 25 to 33 on block? There is no objection. Uh, therefore, the question is that amendments 25 to 33 uh, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament has agreed. Um, the Minister has already moved uh, Amendment 24, so the question is that Amendment 34 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their votes uh, on Amendment 34 now.
and the vote is closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number 34 in the name of Tom Arthur is yes, 88, no, 21. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Uh, that ends uh, consideration of amendments. Uh, as members will be aware at this point in proceedings, the presiding officer is required understanding orders to decide whether or not, in her view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system uh, and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, in her view, no provisions of the Movable Transactions Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. Um, the next item of business is a debate on motion 8810 in the name of Tom Arthur on Movable Transactions Scotland Bill. I would invite any members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons. I would invite members leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly. And I call on the Minister to speak to and move the motion around seven minutes, uh, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to begin by thanking the members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their he helpful and careful consideration of the Bill. I have very much welcomed the Committee's thorough scrutiny of the Bill. It is clear that members have appreciated the importance of getting things right, but they have also appreciated that the process is not always straightforward. I also want to thank the Committee Clerks for all their hard work and those stakeholders who contributed views and opinions as part of the parliamentary scrutiny of the Bill. The Bill is a Scottish Law Commission Bill, and I would therefore also like to thank them for the considerable work which went into this law reform project. In particular, I would like to thank Professor Andrew Stephen and the members of the Scottish Law Commission's working group on this project. Even though Professor Stephen is no longer a commissioner, he and his colleagues have given very generously of their time, insight and expertise throughout this process, and it has been much appreciated. And I would also like to put on record my sincere thanks to the, my Scottish Government officials and the Bill team for their sterling work on this. The Scottish Government has also had some very useful engagement with stakeholders across a range of perspectives. I met with the Federation of Small Businesses and I met twice with representatives of the consumer advice and money advice sector. Their practical experience was important in helping me reach policy, policy decisions on the content of the Bill. They were mixed, but some strong views on the inclusion of individual consumers in the Bill. We listened carefully to those views and to those of the Committee, and the Bill was amended as a result. But despite any concerns about individuals, it was clear that there was consensus that the law in Scotland on movable transactions is outdated and the changes proposed in the Bill would make a significant and positive difference for businesses in Scotland. The Bill is a product of extensive consultation and consideration, both by the Scottish Law Commission and the Scottish Government over the past decade or so, and at its heart is the aim of modernising the law of Scotland relating to movable property transactions, which is vital to the economy of any country with a developed legal system. I would just like to briefly remind the Chamber about some of the key provisions in the Bill and what they are intended to achieve. Part 1 of the Bill reforms the law in relation to the assignation of debt. It will introduce a new register of assignations, which will provide an alternative to intimation as a means for assigning debt. This should be of considerable benefit to businesses. The Federation of Small Businesses in Scotland has indicated that 3,500 small businesses in Scotland fail each year, not because the business is unsustainable, but because the firm cannot get its customers to pay invoices which they are due. Watch one moment, please. The Late Payment of Commercial Debts Interest Act 1998 was introduced to give small and medium-sized enterprises the right to claim interest on late payments. It is, however, it is, however understood that 80 per cent of small businesses do not do so for fear of jeopardising business relationships with customers who often have greater bargaining power. This information was set out in the policy memorandum to the Bill, but I do think it bears repeating today. 
have to give way. Thank you, Johnson. I, I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. And I think the issues that have been uh, highlighted through the, the, the amendment stage notwithstanding, it strikes me that this is probably the most important area in that for, for this to work and be effective and deliver what everyone wants, we need these registers to be efficient and operate in the way that's intended. And that's very much a kind of a, an oversight that, that, that in terms of delivery. So could the Minister maybe set out whether, first of all, he agrees with that insight and, and maybe what steps will be taken to ensure that the registers are are efficient and effective? Minister. Well, of course, there, there will be regulations forthcoming. The ambition is to have the registers up and running by summer of next year. It is, of course, Registers of Scotland, who is an NMO, are directly accountable to the Parliament and will be directly accountable to the Parliament on this as well as all of our other functions. Um, I know members of the committee have had the opportunity, I have certainly had the opportunity as well, to see a demonstration of the uh, alpha and beta versions of the software or the registers themselves. I think this will be a very efficient system. It will be straightforward to use. Um, and I have no doubt that given the outstanding work that Registers of Scotland do in delivering across a range of areas, they will have that continued engagement with stakeholders to ensure that the registers do deliver on the intended outcome set out in statute. And indeed, I know that Parliament will maintain a key interest in how these registers actually function. And of course, we will have the review period as agreed for uh, through amendments to consider not just the operation of the bill, but the specific provisions highlighted um, within the bill around for sole traders, for example, or waiver of defence, but more widely how the registers are operating in practice. I wanted just to come back, presiding officer, to some of the comments from the um, FSB, because in their written evidence they provided a worrying update on the figures that I was referring to earlier and believe the issue is becoming more acute. Over one in ten Scottish firms say late payment is now threatening the viability of their businesses. The ability of a business to assign the debts owed to them is a vital way of improving their cash flow, and that is the lifeblood of many businesses, especially micro and small businesses and new start-ups. The present system is cumbersome, expensive and often impractical, and it does not work in respect of future claims. I would like to once again quote from the Federation of Small Businesses written evidence to the committee at stage one, because that is a key sector of the economy that this legislation will help. They said the need for Scotland small businesses to be able to access, access such finance options is plain. There is a maximum that it is not a lack of profitability that kills businesses, but a lack of cash. And small firms' cash flow is often interrupted by the late payment of sums owed to them. The provisions in part one of the bill are intended to address the current problems businesses face. Part two of the bill deals with security over movable property. In Scotland, there is no such thing as a mortgage over movable as opposed to heritable property in the way that there is in England. Businesses here are faced instead with adopting difficult alternative arrangements, which are often impractical and invariably more costly. For example, the current system of pledge requires the delivery of the property to the creditor. Yet businesses require possession of the assets, such as vehicles, plant and machinery, in order to trade. It is understood that at least one major financial institution will not lend on plant and machinery in Scotland because of the current state of the law on movable transactions. Others will lend, but at a higher rate of interest due to the complex workarounds. This is simply not good enough. It needs to change, and the bill will change it. We heard this in evidence at stage one from UK Finance when he said that in terms of lending against wider assets, the register of statutory pledges will be an important step forward. Large, including global businesses seeking to borrow on the strength of extremely valuable stock that is subject to Scots law are, again, generally only able to do so on the basis of a floating charge at present. The most obvious example of this would be whisky stock. The new regime would allow specific fixed security to be taken against such assets, facilitating new lines of finance. In their view, too, and I quote, the absence of first charge security attracts greater risk and thus a higher cost of funding for the lender, which will inevitably need to be passed on to the customer business, either in whole or in part. Introducing the possibility of having specific security over a range of wider assets through the register of assignations and the register of statutory pledges would help close that gap for smaller businesses in particular. I am convinced that the provisions in this bill will result in reforms to the law which will be of benefit to businesses across Scotland and improve the lending environment to facilitate business growth. So in that presiding office, I move that the Parliament agrees that the Movable Transactions Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you. And I now call on Jeremy Belfer. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I uh, thank uh, the Scottish Government for bringing forward this bill? Um, I think it is a really important bill for um, business and for the commercial side here in Scotland. And as the Minister has outlined in his opening speech, 
I think will allow people to trade easier and quickly, quicker and more efficiently. I do think we have been relying for far too long on English law and certainly the evidence the committee took at stage one was simply as a workaround. People were having to use um, contracts which weren't really fit for Scots law. And I think these changes and this bill will really help. I think there's been a really good working relationship on the committee um, with the Law Commission, uh, with Scottish Government. And I think it shows that the Parliament can work together to bring forward changes that will benefit uh, business here in Scotland. I, I do think there needs to be a wider consideration both by Scottish Government and by the Parliament about how uh, we look at Law Commission reports and bills. Uh, this has been a long time in coming and there are quite a number of other bills in the pipeline waiting to come through which will not great, bring great political excitement but will actually radically change how people can work and live in Scotland. Now I do appreciate there's another one already uh, before the committee um, and, but I do hope that the government will keep bringing these forward over the next three years so that we can deal with some of the backlog that has built up over the last number of years. Um, when we considered our evidence at stage one, there were, uh, I think, two areas which um, raised concern within the committee. The first one was in regard to making sure that we didn't, through the back door, include individuals in regard to this. Um, clearly, we do want sole traders. Uh, we do want partnerships uh, to be able to uh, facilitate the benefits of this bill. But what we didn't want was particularly people misusing the law and then pulling individuals into that. Uh, and clearly, we've had amendments um, from different uh, parties um, around that. I do think on balance we have just about reached the right um, stage in regard to that. Um, I hope individuals won't be drawn into this and I think with the 3,000 figure and we've also taken out um, individual um, household goods we have protected ourselves in regard to that but at the same time we are allowing um, individual sole traders and partnerships to benefit from that. The second area, and uh, the Minister will feel like I'm a broken record on this, is around financial instruments. Um, I do still think that this could have been in the bill, but did not want to bring forward amendments at stage three in case um, it caused any legal problems. However, financial instruments is one of the big areas that this has to cover. Now, I do appreciate that there's ongoing work uh, between the Minister um, and the UK Government, and hopefully once this bill becomes um, an act um, and once all the work is going on for the next year, that things can be progressed quickly on both sides in regard to this. Um, I was pleased that at stage two, the Minister did give a commitment that he is committed to this and that he will work with his officials with the Westminster Government to achieve this. Uh, but it would be helpful, perhaps in his closing, just to re-emphasise that again and be assured that I will be lobbying my UK colleagues at Westminster to make sure that there is no delay in regard to what is happening there. Overall, I think this is a good bill. I think it's a better bill thanks to the scrutiny of the committee and I look forward to it working in practice as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. So not having sat on, on the committee and not having essentially put in those hard yards, I must almost in a sense apologise uh, to those that did put in those hard yards for being something of an interloper. But this is 
an important bit of legislation. I think for those from the outside, it might seem dry, it might seem technical, but having run a small business, I can tell you it's really very important. And can I welcome the words from the Minister reflecting the comments from the FSB, because they're absolutely right. Because many small businesses find getting up and running, or just staying running, incredibly difficult because of their inability to finance. The simple reality is this, is that for many small business owners, they might be set up as a, a, a limited uh, liability company, but the reality is that the only way that they can gain finance is by putting up their house as collateral. And if this in some small way eases that, frees up, provides more options, then it is welcome. I think it's also right that we actually bring the law up to date. I actually found it surprising that assignations weren't possible. These are not just important for things like invoice finance, which is critical for small businesses, many of whom will be transacting with large corporate entities that will force them in, onto terms that, that might not reflect the reality of their cash flow. But actually, on, a, on, a, on that corporate note, assignations are a critical part of a broad range of, of corporate transactions. And the fact that that's not possible simply makes doing business in Scotland more difficult. So making I think it, uh, 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 more possible to set up and run small business is a good thing, but actually facilitating business full stop in Scotland has to be a good thing. Now, I think there were a number of concerns raised through the passage of the bill, and I'm pleased in broad terms that those have been addressed. I think the concerns raised by Mike Daly in the, in the Govan Law Centre and others about the possibility of reintroducing warrant sales through the back door was a very real concern. I think the £3,000 threshold I think the, 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 the removal of individuals and making that explicit that, they're, they're, uh, uh, that, that this is not open to private individuals and indeed the emphasis about primary business use in terms of the assets that are being used I think are all welcome. I would have preferred an automatic mechanism for the uprating. We all know that inflation can uh, 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 you, uh, uh, undermine the value of things over time. And indeed, uh, oversight could mean that that threshold, which I think Stuart McMillan was right, is very fundamental and important, just through neglect could be undermined. But I do note uh, the, 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 the government's commitment to that review, and at, at the very least, it, it, after five years, that will be reviewed. But I think that a mechanism would have been better. Um, and I think likewise, I, th I think the, 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 the Car Carol Mockin's amendments uh, in terms of the specifics of the review, and I did hear what the Minister said, I think regret that, that, that those were overturned. Um, on the more technical points, I think um, I, I would just urge that we have continued interest and oversight in those registers. I think fundamentally for this to work, it's all well and good, I think, seeing uh, you know, beta testing uh, for, of, of software. But actually, ultimately, is once this is up and running, ensuring that it's operating will be absolutely critical. And likewise, I think what we uh, 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 need to ensure is that review period does take in all the key concerns and issues that have been flagged. And it's been good to hear that on the record today uh, from uh, the ministers. But I would also just like to finish up by, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, ending up on some broader reflections. I think there is a need, I think, to actually set out in a more standardised way what we think good practice is in terms of legislative review. I think every single bit of legislation that we have in front of this place, we have the same arguments. You know, it's really important we have a review period, and the government says, oh, that should be onerous and cumbersome, and of course, just trust us to get on with it. I think we might need to reflect on that and maybe come up with a standard form of how we think that that is done. So it's not overburdensome on government, but at the same time does ensure that we keep a watch. Because I think we can all agree that it's much, we're much better off if we proactively look at these things rather than fall back. Now, I'm pleased that there is that, that time period here, but that's not always what we manage to gain when legislation passes. And the final point is one raised by Jeremy Balfour, and is I think a really critical one. The Law Commission does excellent work. They do that ongoing tidying up, that review work of the law that is so critical in terms of ensuring that our law is well functioning. But I would note there are 34 reports that the Law Commission have authored that remain outstanding on action. That's 15% of all the work they have done uh, you know, in, since their in, inception. I think we need to look uh, carefully about how that gets done, but not just because there are things like the, the compulsory uh, 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 tenants associations uh, 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 that I would like to see in terms of ensuring that there are common repairs, but a broad range of other things which are important. 
So again, I think we need to see that commitment from the government to make sure that there is parliamentary time to take through those important bits of tidying up legislation. And I will leave it on that remark, uh, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now move to the open debate, and I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Carol Mockin. Thank you very much, Representative Officer. So today I'm, I'm not speaking as the convener of the committee, but certainly as an SNP member, but I do actually want to put uh, on record uh, my, uh, my uh, regards and thanks to uh, committee colleagues uh, for the, the way we've actually conducted ourselves and uh, the level of scrutiny of this bill uh, throughout the, the process. I'd also like to use some of the time just to kind of highlight the, the aspects of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's work uh, on the bill uh, and certainly the positive impact which I generally believe that the committee has actually had on this bill. I do also want to acknowledge uh, the positive way in which the Scottish Government have engaged with the committee uh, and also its willingness to take on board uh, many of the concerns and issues that have been raised by the committee throughout the process. Uh, I think the point has been touched upon already uh, as well regarding the Scottish Law Commission and uh, as we know when, when the SLC bills uh, tend to be non-party political, non-partisan. They are more kind of technical bills, as uh, Daniel Johnson has alluded to. Uh, and, the, and I think the fact that, uh, that our committee has actually seen a number of these bills come in has highlighted the, the positive impact in terms of the extension of the remit of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, uh, because it has provided uh, that space uh, for some of these SLC bills to be looked at, to be scrutinised, and then be implemented after the, the relevant scrutiny. But uh, I do accept the point that Daniel Johnson has just made regarding the number of bills that are still uh, on reports sitting there at the SLC. Uh, so there's still, a, there's still a, lot, a large amount of work to be done to update uh, Scots law in a wide variety of areas. Uh, I was at an event um, a number of months ago, uh, and it's very unusual for someone to say, ah, you're, the, uh, you're one of the people from this Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. I want to talk to you about a, about a bill so I was at an event here in Parliament, and the very first person I spoke to, um, so he came up and he said to me, he said, this bill that you're looking at, this uh, movable transactions, he said, that's a hugely important uh, piece of legislation. Uh, and, and I said, well, it certainly it's, uh, obviously, it just came into the committee and started the process, and, uh, and we're very much uh, enjoying kind of what we're doing with the, the scrutiny of the bill. Uh, the individual then said, as soon as that bill is implemented, we will be using that from day one. So can I touch upon Daniel Johnson's point as well, and also uh, Jeremy Balfour's. Uh, I mean, Jeremy Balfour touched upon the, the issue of um, the workarounds that have been utilised so far and, uh, and the use of uh, English law, whereas this bill will actually ensure that more money is spent in Scotland. Uh, more money will be spent in the Scottish economy, and that can only be a good thing. So from the outset, the committee was clear that the bill proposes important reforms which uh, could benefit individuals uh, and also businesses across Scotland with access to credit and finance. However, the committee scrutiny did raise a number of issues uh, with the bills introduced, and I, I generally am pleased that some of the recommendations that have been taken forward, the, the, the removing of the ability of individuals to grant a statutory pledge, the taking into account uh, the concerns heard uh, about the potential for the bill to open up a further high-cost credit market, and we consider the protecting of consumers. Secondly, the raising of the value threshold uh, for the statutory pledge items from £1,000 to £3,000. Uh, that certainly will further reduce the risk of household items uh, or, uh, to, be, uh, to be taken, uh, and that which is a good thing. And also the, the, the requiring that only a simple electronic signature is required, making it easier to actually conduct business. I also believe it's important and that the two registers established by the Bill are extended to include financial instruments. Now, the Committee sought regular progress updates on this throughout the scrutiny of the Bill from the UK and Scottish Governments on the Section 104 order, which is something that Jeremy Balfour touched upon. But I think Jeremy Balfour, one of his final comments uh, he said earlier on uh, was the issue regarding this, and I quote, this is a good Bill uh, and I'd uh, like to see it implemented as quickly as possible. This kind of takes me back to the point of the Section 104. In conclusion, if, please. Sure, if the Scottish Government did have this in the bill uh, and the bill was then challenged at some point, that then would have hampered the implementation of the bill. So I think it's that the process that's happened uh, is, is right, so the bill can be implemented, but I absolutely agree. We'd like to get an update on the Section 104 discussions between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. We're certainly happy to support the bill today. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Carol Mockin to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
And um, thanks to all the members um, across the chamber to, uh, debating this very te technical bill. And as a latecomer to the committee, I, I, I did, uh, did recognise that quite early on. Scottish Labour at all stages has supported the modernisation of the legislation and we have recognised the positive impact this is likely to have on access to credit and finance for many different groups and individuals. And I think my colleague Daniel Johnson laid that out quite well. We have worked hard uh, alongside consumer and money advice organisations to get this right and I am satisfied that for the most part we have achieved that. As I said, a, a latecomer to the committee, I think it is important for me to say, coming into that committee at that stage, the work that they've done in the report, it, it really is a, a thank you to the Minister, uh, to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform members that I, I came in to work with, and the clerks, um, for all the support that they gave on this, because some of the technicalities were quite difficult to work through. Um, but everybody took the time to support each other to make sure we got it right because it was seen as such an important piece of legislation. I would, of course, like some of the Labour amendments to have reached the final stages of the bill. Um, as I think that we genuinely did put them in place, particularly at stage two, to um, improve the functioning of the bill. But I do recognise that the Minister has, has shown um, that he recognises that, that we were doing that in good faith. When the legislation was announced, there was, of course, concerns raised by various stakeholders, and that was a priority for myself and for Labour colleagues um, about the potential unintended consequences. And I asked a, a, a question early on in the Chamber, and the Minister and I had a discussion about that. And it was associated with the drafting of the bill and how this might affect people no negatively. But I think from today, um, we can see that we worked hard on those, and I do recognise that in the bill. So, as stated, we agree with the legislation and look forward to its introduction as it removes a key competitive disadvantage uh, Scotland had in comparison to its friends in England. And I trust that the process has moved forward with the concerns of small businesses and sole traders in mind. Um, and, as I said, the, the, the unintended consequences have been removed. And I applaud the cooperation between all of the parties to get us to this point. In closing, presiding officer, um, we in Scottish Labour will continue to scrutinise the bill, and I'm sure the minister will re recognise that, and the operation of the bill to ensure that the commitments that he has made today in the chamber are kept. And um, I look forward to doing that. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. And I call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Bill Kidd. Thank you, presiding officer. I want to begin by thanking all of those involved in the discussions, debate and scrutiny of this legislation over the course of the last few months. In particular, I thank the Law Commission for its report on movable transactions published back in 2017, which contained 203 recommendations for change. Our current laws relating to movable transactions are older than many countries in the world, so I am very grateful to the Commission for all its work on the subject to update our legislation. I am pleased that we will today modernise Scots law in relation to transactions concerning movable property. The Law Society of Scotland has also provided ongoing and useful information and views on different components of the bill, and I am grateful to them for their insight. This bill, as several of my colleagues have said already, is technical in nature, and I thank the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their forensic scrutiny at previous stages. I also thank Tom Arthur, the Minister, for his engagement uh, with me on this issue over the, over the last few months. As someone not involved in the development or formal scrutiny of this legislation, both the Committee's work and the conversations I've had with the Minister have been invaluable for my better understanding of the different elements of the Bill. As we've heard, this Bill seeks to modernise our laws in relation to transactions concerning corporeal, corporeal and incorporeal movable property. Simply put, it will make it easier for businesses to raise finance using their movable property, like vehicles, equipment, intellectual property, future invoices, and so on. This legislation is vital for the efficient and effective operation of businesses, enabling them to raise finance by using assets and selling debt owed to them, or by granting security over movable property, will be, value, will be a valuable tool for them to manage cash flow and potential financial pressures. Making these kinds of transactions more efficient, less expensive and less complicated than they currently are is certainly to be welcomed. 
As the Minister and others have stated so plainly earlier, businesses, perhaps especially smaller businesses, that do find themselves in the position of having to fold, often do so not because of lack of profitability, but because of lack of cash flow. And as we've heard from the whiskey industry, among others, the introduction of the statutory pledge with a straightforward online registration system will improve the lending environment for this and other industries, better supporting these important components of our economy. So-called idle commodities can, with the passage of this bill, be made active, an active part of businesses' operations. On one of the areas of dispute today, that of the automatic uprating of the £3,000 threshold, I do appreciate the, the concerns expressed by Carol Mochen and her colleagues and, that, and, and the view that an automatic uprating would be beneficial. It is certainly true that things like this could slip through the cracks. So I will join with Carol Mochen and others to ensure that we do not let this happen in future. And I know she and, and her colleagues will be at the government to ensure that is the case in future years. Finally, presiding officer, I would just like to place on record again my thanks for all of the work that Citizens Advice Scotland, Step Change and other consumer and money advice groups have done over many months to ensure that consumers were excluded from this bill. Especially now, at a time of the unprecedented cost of living crisis, including consumers in this legislation would cause harm, however unintentional. And with that, I thank you, Presiding Officer, and we will be pleased to support this legislation at decision time. Thank you. And I call Bill Kidd, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, uh, thank you Presiding Officer. Um, and thanks uh, also to the DPLR clerks and the legal team who helped us through all this. Um, President Officer, in short, today's bill will support smaller businesses to raise finance, help them to maintain income and address rising business costs by modernising and simplifying the law on borrowing against movable physical and intellectual property. Overall, this will lead to greater access to finance for businesses um, in Scotland. Our economic growth and prosperity over many decades have been a result of entrepreneurial, talented and motivated workers in every sector, geography and demography, working in a culture that rewards and celebrates innovation and initiative. The economic strategy recognises this and the challenges facing Scotland over the next 10 years and what has been described as a, de a decisive decade. In this decisive decade, growing and proving the seeds uh, providing the seeds for success for small and medium-sized businesses will be pivotal to moving our aspirations. And this bill will form part of the steps we need to take to meet these aspirations. The bill will give new opportunities to small and medium-sized enterprises and other businesses, allowing them to raise finance by securing funds against largely untapped assets, such as vehicles, plant and machinery, or even whisky stores. At the moment, Scots law on movable transactions is a long way behind international standards, which makes some transactions difficult or even impossible to execute here, necessitating the use of cumbersome, complicated and therefore expensive workarounds, or indeed the use of English law, which takes longer and is more expensive for companies in Scotland. We need to give our support to the passing of this bill, because if it is not progressed, Scotland will fall even further behind these established international standards. I believe the Scottish Government has worked constructively and effectively with the Committee and the views of the many organisations who gave evidence. And uh, the amendments from the Scottish Government to the Bill at Stage 2 got the balance right, protecting individual customers, but not denying small businesses and sole traders the opportunity to utilise the provisions in the legislation. Committee members from across the political spectrum expressed their support for the principles of the Bill, and as stated, I believe the Stage 2 process should have indeed cemented this, this support. And for these reasons, I urge members to support the passing of this important legislation, which will help Scotland's businesses, help our economy um, and help us meet our aspirations to deliver economic prosperity for all of Scotland's people and places. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move to winding up speeches and I call on Michael Mara. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the legislation uh, that we have been considering today, although overdue, is welcome. Uh, indeed, we have heard this afternoon that it has been welcomed across the Chamber. And uh, if the bill passes this afternoon, as we would expect it to do, it will bring us up to date with English and Welsh counterparts, of which is something I am sure that we will all welcome. And behind uh, the technical terminology that uh, is used to discuss and debate some of these matters, there are real people whose lives and livelihoods who will be impacted if the bill passes today. I thought the Minister spoke uh, very uh, eloquently to, to the, the need and the difference that it can make in that regard. And we do consider the sole trader hoping to get their business up and running or the small business owner wanting to raise funds without fear of losing their home. And all of those people have the potential to contribute to our economy and to our society in valuable ways. Uh, but all too often, we do see in our society wealth accrue to the already wealthy, um, those with significant heritable property and significant assets, much more able to secure ready credit, uh, while those without are, are locked out. And that is not the kind of economy I think that many of us uh, in this chamber want to see. And the more change that we can do to, uh, to, to, to change that, the better. Uh, but as a country, we are facing uh, severe economic challenges with soaring interest rates, stubbornly high inflation and eye-watering energy prices. The Financial Fairness Tracker Survey, commissioned by Aberdeen Financial Fairness Trust and published in February uh, of this year, found that one in five households in Scotland are currently living in serious financial difficulty, the equivalent of half a million um, Scottish households. And unfortunately, those headwinds show no signs of abating just yet. Research published by the Research Foundation in January 2023 estimated that Britain was only at the midpoint of a two-year income squeeze. And it's vital that we recognise the particular context that we find ourselves in and the additional pressures and households and the businesses in this case that we are discussing today and at this time. I want to uh, place on record my thanks to my Scottish Labour colleagues Paul Sweeney and Carol Mockin for their work on this bill at stages one and two and indeed to all members who participated um, in the committee uh, process and, and also in the debate today. The scrutiny of the bill and I would say that in particular my uh, fellow uh, Labour members concerns for sole traders and individual consumers have undoubtedly fed into the discussions with the Minister uh, and amendments that have enhanced the bill as it stands today. Raising the minimum threshold for an asset to £3,000 in line with the recommendation of the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee will afford greater protection to consumer and to sole traders alike. It is disappointing, um, as outlined by Daniel Johnson and others, that the Government reversed an amendment proposed by Scottish Labour at Stage 2 and agreed to by committee that the minimum threshold of £3,000 be updated annually in line with uh, inflation. Um, and I remain unconvinced, I have to say, by the Minister's arguments in this area. Um, the, uh, we have heard, and I have to say, around the backlog uh, highlighted by various members of the Law Commission bills. And I think that talks to some of the challenges in terms of finding the time, whether it be in committee or in Parliament, that we often hear from government ministers, um, that we uh, struggle to find time to make uh, good on some of the promises of work that is required. So transparency uh, appears to have become the word of the moment in this place. I, I can't imagine why. But I would urge the government uh, to consider its time frame for reporting on the impact of the legislation to ensure that transparency, uh, but to protect sole traders and individuals. I'm sure none of us want to see the rights of individuals negatively impacted, and a timious review would certainly help that. Now, the government can rest assured that members on these benches will continue to scrutinise the operation of the legislation when it comes into effect. We're happy to support it um, and, and hope that it has the support of Parliament today. Thank you. And I call on Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Officer. I suspect, like me, you're a bit of a, a Ronan Keaton fan. And as Ronan Keaton put it, you say it best when you say nothing at all. And I have to say, I'm slightly tempted that we um, have almost said enough in regard to this uh, particular bill. Um, but as a politician, I feel I just have to say a few more words. Um, but I do, thank you, but I do want to, in particular, want to thank uh, those who have made this uh, bill possible. Um, to start uh, with the Law Commission, over 30 years ago, uh, just up the road, I'm, I sat listening to lectures by Professor George Gretton, uh, understanding every fourth word, I think, was a real challenge. 
when you came to give evidence uh, to the committee at stage one. Uh, I have to confess, I'm not sure I understood much more than he said in my uh, second year law lectures. Uh, but the Law Commission did put in uh, an immense amount of work. Um, I do think, as I said in my opening remarks, we do need to look at the pipeline in regard to how we prepare it. But my thanks go to the Law Commission. My thanks go to Scottish Government officials uh, for producing this bill, uh, to the Minister for uh, bringing it through Parliament, to all those that gave evidence to the committee, and to my fellow committee um, members, to the clerks, and to the team here in the Parliament that make our uh, work um, as easy as possible. Uh, the one point I would want to just finally reflect on is the point uh, picked up by Daniel Johnson um, in his opening statement. And that is something I said earlier, but I do think um, across this chamber we do need to look at post legislative scrutiny. Um, it is something that I can see in a number of bills that were passed uh, by previous parliaments uh, under the right intention, but you go back and see in practice how are they working for individuals, uh, for communities, for charities, companies, whoever. And the on honest answer is they're not, but because Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. I mean, does he think that we could not uh, come up with some sort of pro forma review uh, stipulation that we could put into legislation to make this more straightforward, some principles that we could agree on both in terms of timeframes and contents of, of reviews to actually make this more straightforward so we don't get into this negotiation bill by bill? Jeremy Belfer. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's something that, you know, we should look at. Um, I think there are committees up and running, we can look at that and maybe bring forward recommendations, um, either understanding orders or whether there is a pro rata that goes into um, legislation. But, you know, I just think often we as parliamentarians move on and we sometimes forget what has happened in the past. And obviously each parliament brings in new MSPs who aren't aware of the history of what has gone on uh, before. However, um, to finish on a positive, I think this bill is uh, something that will help business here in Scotland. Um, I think it is a, a bill that we can all support, and I look forward to it passing in a few minutes' time. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on the Minister to wind up the debate. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I can begin again by thanking everyone who has contributed this afternoon and recognising Mr Balfour's point that the reality of politics is that the debate isn't over when everything is said, but only once everyone has said it. Um, but I think it's been a very useful debate that we've had and had an opportunity to explore a range of issues. And this bill is indeed sizable and to some, as has been noted earlier, may seem dry and technical. And there is also some complexity, not least in respect of the insolvency provisions we considered earlier, but a detailed and methodological approach is what is needed to address the particular challenges of reforming law which is outdated and no longer fit for purpose. I hope it is clear that we have listened carefully to what has been said by stakeholders and by the committee and other MSPs at both stage one and stage two. And I hope that it's clear too that this bill matters. It matters to the estimated 360,910 private sector businesses operating in Scotland as of March 2022. The vast majority of these businesses, 98.3%, were small with 49 or fewer employees. It is clear that cheaper and less risky access to finance will provide a boost to these businesses, not just in terms of survival and making ends meet, but also in terms of development and growth by improving the facility and the ability for businesses to innovate and expand. Anything that can be done to improve the environment in which business in Scotland operates should be welcomed. So whilst this bill is legal and specialist, on the ground, it is intended to deliver real and practical help to businesses across Scotland. I was happy to lodge amendments at Stage 2 to implement some of the Committee's thoughtful recommendations, particularly in relation to individual consumers. I have also been pleased to support some of the amendments made by the Committee at Stage 2, and we have agreed some adjustments to these today to ensure that they work as intended. I hope members will appreciate on reflection why we have needed to reverse some of the other amendments made at stage two. However, some of those reversals have come with commitments. 
namely to consult further in respect of the definition of insolvency and to keep the threshold for, an un for encumbered property for sole traders under regular review so that it does take account of inflation. If this bill is passed today, as I sincerely hope it will be, there is still a lot of work to be done before the provisions will be capable of coming into effect. The provisions in relation to both assignation and statutory pledge rely on the creation and operation of two new registers, which will be run by Registers of Scotland. Considerable progress has already been made on the necessary technology and development in terms of progress. We are in a very good place, with the necessary funding also in place. Quite detailed regulations will also need to be in place to set out the rules regarding use of both the registers. Again, progress is being made here, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank those in Register of Scotland who are undertaking this work and for their close and helpful cooperation with officials in the Scottish Government. As I mentioned, I have undertaken to consult on the complex issues around how we define insolvency for the purposes of this legislation, and that will take place over the course of the next year, with any necessary regulations being made in time for the provisions coming into force. Now, as expected, mention has been made this, af af this afternoon of the need to ensure that the provisions in the Bill extend also to financial instruments and financial collateral. Extending the Bill to financial instruments and financial collateral is something, and I hope I have been very clear on this, that I am absolutely and fully committed to achieving and will be working with the UK Government to have this in place, so we have a necessary Section 104 order to achieve this. So in that spirit, I very much welcome Mr Balfour's remarks um, and his intimation that he will be encouraging his uh, uh, Conservative colleagues in the UK Government uh, to, con to continue their constructive engagement. And can I also thank the work of the Committee in taking an interest in this and taking the step of engaging, seeking to engage directly with the UK Government. I think this is something um, where we are absolutely united in recognition of the benefits this will confer on the Scottish economy, and we want to ensure that we can achieve that Section 104 order in as smooth a manner as possible so that these provisions are ready to come online when the new registers are in place next year. Consultation will also need to be undertaken on the issue of the fees for using the registers. And again, we will be relying on and working with registers of Scotland on this aspect of the legislation. There is, as I said, still a lot to be done, but our target is to have all of the necessary consultations, regulations and function registers completed by next summer. And at that point, we will commence the main provisions. Importantly, the Bill incorporates powers so that we have the tools and flexibility to ensure that provisions can be kept up to date. Some of the powers are likely to be used rarely, but nevertheless, as time passes and we gain knowledge and experience of how the registers are being used and the extent to which they are being used, Scottish Ministers will have the ability, subject of course to the scrutiny of the Scottish Parliament, to, for example, specify the type of case for which registration of an assignation would be compulsory, to provide a model notice of assignation, to refine what constitutes a seriously misleading inaccuracy in the registers, to extend the categories of persons who are entitled to make an information request, to add to the kinds of incorporeal movable property over which it is possible to grant a statutory pledge. I could go on, but I hope this illustrates that, subject to what it is reasonable to delegate, efforts have been made to future-proof this bill to help it stand the test of time. So from that perspective, oh, I, although I didn't feel um, a review duty was necessary, um, I have always been of the view that the legislation should and would be reviewed as necessary. And the government does look forward to the opportunity to review it in due course. Finally, I would like to repeat my thanks to all those who gave evidence to help improve the bill during its parliamentary proce uh, uh, process. This, as has been highlighted, I think demonstrates the Scottish Parliament working at its best, detailed scrutiny from the committee, considered engagement with a, a range of stakeholders. And this legislation, which I appreciate has taken a long time to come to fruition, is something I think the Parliament can collectively can be proud of. And I once again want to put on, on the record my sincere thanks to the Law Commission, to stakeholders, to the committee, and to everyone who has contributed towards getting the bill into the state it is today. Um, and in that, I commend the motion in my name. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Movable Transactions Scotland. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. And I'm 
minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now, and I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion. Thank you very much, and happy to do so. Thank you, Minister. The question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Uh, point of order, Christine Graham. Yes. Uh, presiding officer, I'm terribly sorry to return to something I raised last week, but I, I would uh, seek your guidance in that once again we have on the benches of the Conservatives only three members in the chamber at decision time, and I wonder if presiding officers would, would consider looking at this issue of attendance at Parliament in person rather than remotely, unless there's good reason. Um. Thank Ms Graham. Uh, Ms Graham will be aware, as are all members, that the facility um, exists whereby members can exercise their vote remotely, and that is a matter for the members. Now, there is one question to be put as a result of today's business, and can I encourage members to refresh their devices? I have, can I please call Edward Mountain online for a point of order? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I was one of the people that uh, was very keen on seeing the ability to have uh, virtual contributions and virtual voting. I believe that the point of order that Christine Graham has raised now twice goes against the whole principle of what this Parliament stood for and what this Parliament's trying to achieve. And it's no more than a political a uh, cheap shot at, at people who are not attending the Parliament. I wonder if the presiding officer could give, give me further guidance on whether she thinks continued points of order of this are appropriate or required. Excuse me, members. Members, I will hear. I will hear Mr Mountain, and I do regard that as dis discourteous and disrespectful and unhelpful. Mr Mountain, I'd be grateful if you could please repeat your last point. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I, I cannot uh, comprehend why the Chamber is finding it difficult, why some people were, might want to contribute virtually, especially uh, considering that uh, some people have long ways to go and have other things to do, but have followed the debate all afternoon, as I have done. Uh, and I find it actually discourteous for Christine Graham to continue to re raise these points when it's something that the Parliament agreed as a whole to do. And I wondered if you could give me guidance on that, presiding officer. I thank you, Mr Mountain, and I will just reiterate, um, as I said previously, this is a facility that exists and it is wholly um, within the gift of members to decide where they will be participating um, and from where they will be voting. Now, I would be grateful if members could ensure that they have refreshed their devices following the vote earlier. The question is that motion 8810 in the name of Tom Arthur, Unmovable Transaction Scotland Bill be agreed and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed.
The result of the vote on motion 8810 in the name of Tom Arthur is yes, 111. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed and the Movable Transactions Scotland Bill is passed. That concludes decision time and I close this meeting.